Hi, and welcome back to every single Keanu Reeves movie ever made. Recording attempt number two. Number two. This is what it's like being in the professional world, Leo. Hi. We got new microphones, but we'll, we'll see about that. I know literally nothing about this, which is wild, having done my dissertation on sound in movies, but I have like very little to zero practical experience. So we're kind of winging this. If we do end up using the mics, and I'll let you know if we do, please let us know in the comments if you hear a difference, because that would be really, really cool. Anywho, without any further ado, <laughs> What were the films we did this week? Uh, this week we watched Chain Reaction from 1996 and Feeling Minnesota, I was also from 1996. Feeling Minnesota, which I keep wanting to call like Raising Arizona because it's just one of those titles. Also, it's not a very memorable movie. It's not, um, but we will get to that. I think we're going to end up talking a lot more about that, to be honest, because you know, probably there's some more to talk about, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, because Chain Reaction is just like a fairly effective Hollywood movie. It's just like a good action movie. There's not any problems with it. There's nothing particularly good about it. Well, I thought the script was really solid. That's probably what holds it together. Yeah. Two people doing the screenplay, three people doing the story. But one of the main guys doing the story was Arnie or Arn Schmidt, who actually produced Robocop along with another couple of huge Hollywood movies. And then uh, you had the guy that did uh, Pretty Woman doing the screenplay. So a lot of like big talent in the writing side of things, mm -hmm. without which I think the movie would have been sort of forgettable. Even acting wise, I think they had like big names because you have Brian Cox, a Dundee Uni alumni, by the way. I've met him, really nice guy. I've met him at a charity do once. <laughs> <laughs> you also got Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman, who does a really good job. He holds like a big part of the movie together, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Rachel Weisz. Mm -hmm. Always good. Uh, Kenya Reeves, obviously. The janitor from Scrubs. Janitor from Scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's one of the two things that connects both movies that we watched this week. They both had like some really big names. One to its detriment, maybe, and the other one, you know, made a little bit better use. Yeah, I feel like in the context of Chain Reaction, all the big names seem to fit quite comfortably with the final product. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Feeling Minnesota, you watch it and you're just so confused by how they afforded all of these actors. Well, they, they afforded all the actors by cutting on every single other things in the movie. Yeah, including like apparently not having a single cinematographer on set. Cause... Really? Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm just All right, I'm because, because it looks like shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Right, so what's the, what's the setup for, uh, for Chain Reaction? So it came out about 10 years before everyone started really caring about climate change. 10 yeah. years before An Inconvenient Truth, and definitely 10 years before it became properly like, fashionable. But I think at the time, people were becoming aware that the world's resources are running out and like it was in the public knowledge that we need to do something about it. It starts with this speech by the scientist saying like, look, we need a clean energy source and we think we've got one. We're going to use water and we have this machine created by a small group of scientists which will revolutionize the world. Yeah, the final goal is to actually create the machine and then just release it for free mm -hmm. to to everybody. Which the coal barons will not like, obviously. So it starts off with the whole environmental stuff mm -hmm. and then it turns into what actually is, is just a chase movie. When uh, the building with the machine in it gets blown up and these two scientists get framed. And then they're on the run for the whole movie and that's it. Pretty much. Can we talk about the explosion at the start, by the way? <laughs> the explosion at the start is maybe my favorite bit. It's just a really good way to get the movie going. So obviously the uh, the machine they're making is extracting hydrogen from water. So some bad guys, some goons come around the building, uh, kill the main scientist, kidnap the Chinese scientist, mm -hmm. and then tamper with the machine. So when Kianyu comes back and he sees the dead scientist, he mm -hmm. realizes the machine is about to explode. So he goes back to a motorbike and he starts kind of riding away because obviously if this machine explodes, it essentially creates like a hydrogen bomb kind of explosion. Is a hydrogen bomb an atomic bomb? Yes, but also no. So he's just riding away from the explosion as it happens. It, it, special effects, not great, but pretty fun sequence. I don't think there were any explosives involved. What? Do you think it was all CGI? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I, I did see this movie last week, so I don't remember it that well, but I think it was all CGI, yeah. Either way, really, really fun. Yes. So after they, they, uh, they get framed, they don't really explain it, or maybe it's a little bit confusing, but essentially the bad guys are a separate part of the government. Almost immediately the FBI is following them. 
-hmm. they're in a in a pub and their faces come up on the screen and they're like oh shit we, yeah. we need we need to leave now mm -hmm. but let's not leave together so like, they leave a whole 10 seconds yeah uh, rachel gets in a cab Kianyu decides not to for some reason, even though he's literally there as she hasn't left. So while she's away safe, someone recognizes him. So he's just running down the street and like a bunch of cop cars come around. Like none of them are actually chasing him. Like all the policemen are chasing him on foot. Yeah, I never actually thought about that before. That's true. <laughs> People get out and just start chasing him on foot. Till he gets to uh, to a retractable bridge and the, uh, the, the bridge is obviously going up because like, of course it would be. Since it's the only way he can escape, he just kind of goes up the bridge as it's going up. Which I really thought was going to be another speed moment. Unfortunately, they don't do that because that might have been a bit much, but I thought he was just going to run up and then like jump the gap between the bridges. I got really excited. They really set it up like that and then yeah. it kind of disappoints you because he just ends up going to the top and then he's like, oh, oh, how, what, what do I do now? Mm. What, what, what am I supposed to do? So he just kind of goes down the bridge blocks it from going down by putting like a metal thing in it tricks the police into not being able to find them i think i missed something there i don't know yeah it feels kind of far-fetched that he escapes at that point but then he somehow makes it to the train station and he meets rachel rachel who spends a lot of the first half of the movie kind of babushka into this <laughs> that's just her style that's that's just that's how she how she dresses i thought it was a weird uh costume choice but well know. she's british so it's fine you know british people they're a bit, they're a bit kooky, you know. <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, and then you just you start into the main part of the movie, which is just how do we make them running away and being completely alone and deserted in the world? How do we make that as exciting as possible? And I think they do a pretty good job. Well, I think that's the least interesting part because, like, the the movie becomes really interesting by um, having the different factions essentially, because mm -hmm. you obviously have Keanu Reeves and Rachel. You have uh, the FBI guys yeah. who are actually not portrayed as bad. They're just trying to do their job. And then you have the, the Morgan Freeman, Brian Cox faction mm -hmm. who is trying to like hide themselves and not make themselves obvious. Even though at some point they, uh, they send a helicopter after Keanu Reeves and Rachel Weisz, mm -hmm. there's a sniper in the helicopter who kills the janitor from Scrubs. Yeah, he kills the he kills the policeman. Just like that, surely there there was a better way to go after them than send a helicopter with a fucking sniper. Yeah, I also thought that they could have cornered them a little bit more by having like two helicopters. I don't know, some guys on foot, but also let's make it clear: the Morgan Freeman, Brian Cox faction needs Keanu Reeves because he discovered like a frequency that actually makes the machine work, which they don't have. Yeah, he he's like the genius scientist, so I guess it makes sense that they wouldn't just try and like kill him from afar. Like, but that's what the, that's what they're trying to do. They've got a big fucking helicopter that's shooting at them. Well, they shoot the police, so the police can't get them. That's kind of the moment when you realize it's not just the uh, authorities that are chasing them, it's somebody else. And that's the point where they're like, right, we can't even trust the people that we work with. And that's when they run out and they do the really cool bit with the snowmobile yeah. on the ice. So really a snowmobile is like a, a, a boat with one of those big fans in the back, but they use oh, it to essentially traverse this like frozen lake I mean, it's not that exciting, but like you care a lot about the characters and like the stakes of, of yeah. what's going on. So you, you're you really rooting for them. At some point, they, they stop the boat, they get off, and then they jam the uh, acceleration. That was pretty clever, I like that. And then they get into that abandoned house and like he needs to warm up Rachel after she gets really cold. <laughs> and that's when you're like, oh, this she is going to be like a romance thing. <laughs> she falls down to the knees in, uh, in really cold water. She's like, oh, I'm going to die. You ever fallen into really cold water but though? He also did it. Why was it just her? It's like half her to her knees. Like just fucking take off your trousers. Because he's Keanu Reeves. It's his job in the movie to prop up the damsel in distress. <laughs> Here's the thing though. There's no corny kissing moment. There's no uh, oh, they're now together moment. Is there not? I don't think so. Huh. All right. Because we complain about it. Uh, for... Um, oh, Johnny Mnemonic. Johnny Mnemonic. There's a moment like that which feels like really out of place. But in this one, they're just doing their thing. And I guess they kind of fall into each other's arms in the way that you would if you were in like a life or death situation. Yeah, think. she actually ends up saving his life at the end. She does. The end bit is really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, let's just skip all the middle part because I don't think there's that much interesting. Like, it's interesting to watch. It's just like, it, there's nothing massively interesting to talk about. Nah. It's a lot of running. There's a lot of good action. There's a lot of like very competent mobile camera work. Yeah. It's got a good sense of motion to it, as a chase movie should. Morgan Freeman does a really good 
good job being like the the sneaky bad guy. He's yeah. so good at like being sinister but really likable at the same time. Yeah. Essentially, Ken Reeves ends up knowing uh, their secret bases uh, by uh, finding a plate from a truck and then entering a cop car that stayed open while a cop was doing something else. Mm -hmm and checking the plate number and seeing like where it was registered to. Very convenient that he was able to do that, right? Why, why would you register a secret van to uh. a secret facility? Surely you would have some kind of front for that? I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, the bit with the facility, what did you think of all of that? It's really confusing because Keanu Reeves sneaks into it and then while everybody's away, he gives them the frequency that he found to make the machine work, but then it just it doesn't ask for it. It's like, okay, I fixed it, so let me go. It's like, what the f You should ask him to let you go and like, you know, tell the FBI that it wasn't your fault before you give them the frequency. Yeah, maybe actually. I don't know. Uh, so just some shit goes down. Uh, I don't really remember that part of the movie. Apart from the very end bit where there is another cool explosion sequence. Mm -hmm where the place blows underneath them and they have to get into this metal... Um, elevator? You... Yeah, a kind of like metal elevator on a crane. Yeah. And there's like, again, a kind of speed moment where they end up like being shoved out of this thing Oh together. yeah, so they do actually, yeah. And everyone's outside, like all, all the miners? Are they miners? Uh, I think they're just normal workers actually. All the workies like clap and it's like this big like celebratory moment, like... I don't even think these people even know who Keanu and Rachel are. They're yeah. just happy that they that they're they, there. They die, even though a bunch of people <laughs> died inside because they uh, they they just stayed in there. They don't even have like a final confrontation. Morgan Freeman gets out safely. He calls the government up. He's like, right, we'll have to cancel plan, and then he just drives away. Yeah, does he not get reprimanded or anything? No, he just no, gets again, scot free. Well, he's part like he's part of the government, so like he, he wouldn't get reprimanded, surely. Yeah, no, I suppose, I suppose. Yeah, he gives him a call, and he's like. Plan X is no longer viable. Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> this movie apparently has a 14% on, what was it, Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, 18%. Still not great. It really doesn't deserve it. It's it's definitely not an 18% movie. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's very effective, right? It's like more than 60 for sure for me. Okay. I would give it like a good 45, 50. 45 out of 50? 45 to 50 out of 100. I really? Say. You really liked it. See, okay, it was one of those movies where I really liked it when I watched it, but now that we're talking about it, I feel like it, the structure was a little messy. I didn't have anything that made it stand out against all the other movies of that ilk that were coming out at the time. Like, what is the USP? Well, yeah, but I think you're tired of it now because there's so many of other movies that have done kind of the same thing. And also because we, this is the second time we've talked about this. Fair. Because no. we've had to re-record it. Certainly a lot better than the other movie that we watched, <laughs> which we should get into. Good segue. Thank you very much. <laughs> I enjoy my segues, you know that. Really? Um, so, Feeling Minnesota. Aye. Also in 1996 and is the first movie directed by general filmmaker man Stephen I've Bagelman? I've written Bagelman, but I don't think that's how you say his name. I think it is. Bagelman? He's got a kind of sparse directorial career, but he did do Miles Ahead in 2015, which I thought was a really competent movie. Is that the sequel to 8 Mile? <laughs> it's a biopic about uh, Miles Davis. Very much an evolution from what we see in Feeling Minnesota, which is kind of like what happens when you get Quentin Tarantino, love of the Coen brothers, and not knowing what to do with those influences. See, I saw a lot of people making the comparison with Tarantino or the Coen brothers, but fuck man, like it, I, I really did not see it. Maybe a little bit at the end when like stuff starts going wrong and there's kind of like the uh, Coen brothers moment. Or at the start, see at the start is when I thought a lot about uh, Tarantino. Oh yeah? He starts the film with a very sort of Tarantino-esque sensibility towards using uh, like pop and rock music. But it sort of dies nearer the end. Like maybe even it dies after the first like 20 minutes. It dies after the intro credits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, okay. <laughs> the intro is good. He's going for something in the intro. You have a Johnny Cash song and you've got Johnny Cash like on the TV singing away and you have these sort of home movie segments and you know he's trying to get into that sort of like um, subjective headspace of the character and like all the, the music that they listen to going back into their childhood and trying to capture like a feeling and a time. He doesn't quite commit enough 
to that. Yeah. Well, it doesn't commit to it because it's quite hard. Yeah, it's quite hard. You, you need a lot of resources. You need like rights to songs and stuff like that. Here's but... the thing. The, the movie, like, I, I don't know where the fuck the budget went because it definitely didn't go on locations. No. And it definitely didn't go on script and definitely didn't go on uh, music. Or cinematography. Or cinematography. <laughs> they do have an all-star cast, kind of. You have really big names like uh, the guy that plays Edgar in Men in Black. Need them much sugar water. Yeah. <laughs> he plays Kenya Reeves' brother. But then you have Dan Aykroyd. Oh my god, Dan Aykroyd. Is he quite famous by this point? I think, well, he obviously like made a fuckload of money from Ghostbusters. Mm. But then, he, I think his career just kind of fizzled out. At this point, this was two years before Blues Brothers 2000, mm. which was, I think, like the last movie, like not big movie, but like the last Hollywood movie that he's done. He's probably still living off of the... Yeah, well, that's the thing. Now he's doing a bunch of other stuff. I know he's produced a bunch of movies, but like 1996, I think, is when his career started to fizzle out. But this movie is also produced by Danny DeVito. Yeah, it's got like three producers. One of them, maybe Danny DeVito just liked the director and he was like, I'm going to give you a chance, you know? Hey, I'm going to give you a chance. You have fucking Cameron Diaz. Cameron Diaz. You can tell she's going to be like a big star. She's not particularly good in it, I'll be entirely honest she was quite good like she's quite annoying but i think that's what her character is meant to be like i think roger ebert described this film i read his review of it he described this film as um it's about characters who you're glad to see in films but if you saw them in real life you would probably they would probably give you a headache yeah okay that's pretty fair yeah and i think he sort of praised its use of this kind of like a gritty grim uh feeling that it tries to give off boy is it grim and oh boy is it gritty and grim yeah. they uh, the sets include the side of a railroad, uh, a dingy motel, this like another like really shitty looking road, uh, a strip club or the back of a strip club. Mm -hmm. uh, is that that's it? There is like a nondescript piece of forest, kind of like the forest, and then we started laughing because we were we we got to thinking about that bit in Sopranos where Polly and uh, Chris are lost in the woods. Yeah, <laughs> Polly being Edgar. Yeah, Just obviously. And uh, Chris being uh, Keanu Reeves. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as funny as uh, Polly and Chris getting lost in the woods. No, not quite. Even though it's classed as a comedy crime drama. See, mm. I was very surprised when you told me about that because it's not funny. It's surprising, isn't it? It's not funny at all. No. I think the, the script has these like little glimmers of what could have been it's funny. I had to write it down to remember it, which probably shows you that it wasn't that funny. But um, I think they tried to create this like old married couple dynamic between them. And I think that had the potential to be kind of funny, but again, maybe wasn't. Well, well, the motivation in the movie is just like really hard to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. Cameron Diaz needs to be married to Edgar. Yeah. Edgar. Ed Edgar? Edgar. Edgar. Cameron Diaz needs to be married to Edgar because Edgar helped the owner of the strip club Cameron Diaz works mm -hmm. for to find money that he thought Cameron Diaz has stolen. Mm -hmm. So he arranges a marriage between him and Cameron Diaz mm -hmm. and he invites his brother over for the marriage, uh, for the ceremony. Which is a bad idea because if the woman already doesn't want to get married and, you know, Keanu Reeves shows up. So they end up fucking, but there's no setup that they just end up fucking. On like this horrible bathroom carpet. Yeah. I couldn't stop looking at the carpet. <laughs> It was so ugly. That, that's what you got out of that scene. Yeah. And then they are in a relationship, which you can obviously tell from the start that she's just doing it because she doesn't want to be married to the other guy. She then stays with Edgar for like four days mm -hmm. and then Keanu goes to her and they just escape. Just like that. They escape, but they don't escape very far. They escape like down the road. And then she forces him to go back to get money from his brother. Mm -hmm. and then like his brother finds her, but... He shoots her in the stomach yeah, because she doesn't want to live with him. And then he puts her body back in Keanu Reeves' motel bedroom. And Keanu Reeves thinks that he's killed her. Or he's he, not sure. He's not sure, yeah. So he ends up dumping the body on the side of a road and leave, like yeah. shallowly covering it with leaves and then <laughs> fucking off. And it's just like the movie is an hour and a half long. They never like stop to actually try to develop it in any way no and the whole setup which is meant to be what 
you know, is the catalyst for the movie. You mm -hmm. kind of have to just infer it from what's going on in the yes. first 10 minutes. Like we had to look up the plot on IMDb to be like, who are these people and what are their motivations? Which you shouldn't have to do or you shouldn't want to do yeah. if it's engaging enough. Here's the thing, I can absolutely see the moment where you actually kind of started being kind of like Tarantino funny was when they get a call by the motel owner telling them that he's, he's seen them move a body in and out of, of their room mm -hmm. and he wants like 50,000. Fuck, yeah. somebody, somebody see us, we need like $50,000. Mm -hmm. So the brother goes to, to the strip club owner and kills him and takes his money. Keanu Reeves goes to the house, to the motel owner's house and discovers that the woman that he thought was dead is actually still alive. Yeah. So there's like a moment where his brother is just shooting like the the um, the safe to try and open it. Mm -hmm. the, the, <laughs> the shot pans out. So like his center frame kind of far back, like, and it's just like shooting it. And it's like, he's obviously going to shoot himself by mistake. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah, of course it happens. Mm -hmm. And then he, he tries to open the safe and it's been open the whole time. So that's like kind of when like there's some funny stuff going on because it's such an absurd mm -hmm. situation, but it's more like you you see the characters and they're all like really kind of dumb. And they're all just kind of like flailing around yeah. and there's this, this element of absurdity yeah. about it. Yeah. Here's the problem, that happens an hour into the movie. Also, it's not played up enough. It's not played up enough. It, yeah. it, the way you make that, the way Tarantino, I suppose, would make that is that you, you make the start really quick. You shrink it in like 30 minutes and then you have the rest of the movie with the characters trying to figure out a way out of this. And you start in Medias Rest, which this guy tries to do, but it's so confusing that... It doesn't really. Yeah, I don't know. Also, it's shot kind of like an art movie at times. That's what you, you told, you said. Like, did you notice how many two shots were in this movie? No. Okay, the way that this guy films conversations, I don't know if it was intentionally to make everything look very claustrophobic and cramped and art movie-esque, or if it was just because sometimes you couldn't afford to have two cameras. Well, listen, uh, Evie, cameras are expensive. What are you gonna do? Have like three cameras in the same scene? It's one scene and just in one camera. Just get money, dude. It's not that hard. <laughs> well, he clearly had money because he's got like a bunch of like, maybe not big name actors, but like, not completely unknown actors. Yeah, it's so like the money was coming from somewhere. He had to have some of it somewhere. So maybe it was intentional. Maybe he just wanted like a very sort of on the fly gorilla style looking conversations. Gorilla style? Gorilla, uh... Oh, gorilla. Unfortunately, has nothing to do with uh, actual gorillas. That's sorry. very unfortunate. I got really excited there for a second. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think a lot of the money actually went on Los Lobos. I forgot to say that I saw in the credits that they did the music. Los Lobos? Los Lobos are a fairly famous band. The music was very forgettable, I'll be entirely honest. It kind of was, right? Yeah. It was. I liked the use of pop music, but again, if you do that, make it consistent throughout the movie. So there's always these moments of like fantasy and uh, transcendence. Yeah, I think we, we drew a lot of comparisons specifically with like the little green bag scene in Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. And that's when you commit to like actually hearing a large portion of a song and you just enjoy the vibe that that song gives off. There's just no moment like that in this though. The script absolutely kills this movie. Yeah. And the fact that all the characters are really unlikable and like the pacing is really bad, but like the script is just not interesting. Did you notice like how hard they tried to push the whole whimsical uh, female character thing with Cameron Diaz? Every conversation they have, she's like, do you believe in fate? <laughs> it's like, come on, dude. Nobody talks like that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It just wasn't very good. Also, most of it is shot at night. There's like two scenes uh -huh. shot in the day and they're both at the start of the movie and then everything else just happens at night. Like, I know ex extras are expensive, but... Yeah. It gets so boring only seeing things happen at night. And I couldn't figure out why I was so visually unstimulated until about two thirds of the way through the movie. I was like, all I'm seeing is just like darkness in the frame. Well, here's the problem. It's shot in Minnesota, which obviously looks like shit. Well, look at Fargo. That's not all shot at night. It looks pretty cool. But I guess then they've got the snow to... Yeah. Where was the snow in this movie? I thought Minnesota was snowy. In winter, I suppose it might be, yeah. What, what else do you have? What else have I got? How did he get into his house? How did the police oh, get yeah. there? Yeah, okay, so there's yeah. a really confusing scene. This is where they, they cram like what should have been like maybe 30 minutes of action mm. into like five to 10 minutes. So Ken Reeves goes to his brother's house. Somehow he's able to get in without any problems. Don't know why the, the guy doesn't lock his his front door or something. They then have a fight, which is actually okay. He gets his ear bitten off, which is pretty funny. The fight was quite cool. But then for some reason, Dan Aykroyd, who is one of the policemen, knows that he has to go to the house, even though nobody's called him. Yeah. So he gets to the house. 
he gets knocked out immediately. Ken Reeves leaves in his car and his brother, rather than taking his car, he steals the cop's car. And then when he gets to the place where Keanu is, instead of taking the car that he that he had, oh, he yeah. steals another car that has a horse in it. It's got like a yeah, it's got like a horse box in the back. It, 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 like it's just so strange. All the sequence makes no sense. I had such a hard time following what was going on there. Especially the horse box bit, which I know was another attempt at absurdist humor, but it, it doesn't quite land. There's no payoff. The only payoff is like he's in a Denny's and he looks outside and somebody's stealing his horse and some woman goes like, hey, isn't that your horse? The waitress was quite good, actually. I thought, honestly, if you had more interaction with like him and the waitress. That could have been fun. I've also written Fat Raccoon. There is a Fat Raccoon. I can, I can attest to that. He's pretty chunky. It is chunky. It was cute. And the man on the phone, probably my favorite characters. There's a guy who uses a payphone. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, if you'd given the side characters more room, this movie would have felt a lot more fleshed out. Yeah. And it would have felt more like, okay, if you set something in like a kind of rural-ish place where it has like a reputation for being a bit eccentric, you want to kind of do what Fargo did and lean into that idea yeah. of this place is populated by like David Lynchian odd people right and you you, well, you want to meet like a band of eccentrics I, I absolutely agree you want to have like small interactions with other people that make those tarantino-esque interactions funny exactly so um yeah uh, weird moment in keanu's career he's 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 floating along quite happily though three years left until the matrix though you know just gonna building yourself up to that point how many films have we got to go until we can watch the matrix i don't want to watch the matrix well there's some stuff oh wow Last time I committed suicide. Okay, haven't heard of that. And then... Devil's Advocate. That's meant to be good, right? Right. Well, thank you for joining us for this discussion. Yeah, always happy to have you. And we will be here again next week, or if technical issues arise, maybe two weeks from now, but no later than that. Perfect. See you next time. See you next time. Keep it groovy, dudes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs>